Soy baby, let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the good things, all the bad things that may be. Let's talk about soy. Let's talk about soy. Hi and welcome to the second episode of Where Do You Get Your Protein TV. In the last episode, we talked about protein in general. And in this episode, I would like to um, go a little bit more specific and talk about soy as a specific protein source or um, as a specific part of your nutrition. So when it comes to soy, um, there are lots of misunderstandings and there is a lot of controversy because some people really think that uh, soy is the devil in uh, the disguise of, of, of food and other people mm, really think that soy can be a good idea and, and can, can really uh, work for your health and so on. So um, I want to uh, just check the facts and um, just check the cons and the pros uh, towards soy. And I would just begin with the, with the cons because I think uh, on, on, this, on the con side, there is a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of misconception when it comes to the real facts. So one thing that you're going to hear, and it has pretty much nothing to do with nutrition, um, is that soy basically is destroying the environment. So, how is that? It goes a little bit something like, uh, you tell someone that you're vegan, and they go like, ah, so you eat a lot of tofu. Your tofu is destroying the environment, my friend. You have heard about deforestation and monocultural farming. So, <laughs> um, that's pretty much the, the, the argument. And let's let's check the facts now. So, um, when it comes to soy production, uh, global so soy production, you have to um, know that there are two branches. One branch is soy oil, soy oil production. The other branch is soy meal production. So soy oil production actually goes uh, in, in, in large amounts into uh, um, food production for, for, for people, for, uh, for humans, and into the production of um, biofuel. Now you have to know that um, soy oil has pretty much nothing to do with vegans. If you're consuming soy oil, it just takes the place of other plant-based oils. So it pretty much has nothing to do with, uh, with with being vegan or not. So that's the one thing. Biofuel also has nothing to do with vegans or, or anything else. What has something to do with vegans is soy protein because vegans consume things like uh, tofu, and uh, other foods that are high in soy protein. And that's what you have to look for if you want to check the effects of uh, increasing numbers of vegans uh, and, uh, and the production in general. So um, let's see where all that soy protein goes to. And if you take a look on that and take a look on the statistics, you find out that more than 90% of soy protein production actually goes into the stomachs of livestock. It goes to factory farms. It goes uh, into the production of meat. So what you find out is that this monocultural style farming, which leads to deforestation, is not based on the consumption of uh, uh, that, that is produced by, um, by vegans, but is actually caused by the behavior of meat eaters because it goes into the production of meat. So you see, that's the first uh, misunderstanding. Um, okay, let's now go to other points. Okay, when it comes to health issues, and if you talk to uh, bodybuilders or strength athletes or fitness athletes, um, there is, you're going to hear one word and that's phytoestrogens. What are phytoestrogens? <laughs> phytoestrogens uh, are actually plant hormones. So, um, like animals, plants also use hormones as, uh, as, as a way to um, take signals from one part of the organism to another part of the organism. 
to understand how hormones work, you have to understand that the hormone itself is the carrier of the signal, of a signal. So the cell in the body, in the plant or in the animal, um, then is the receiver of that signal. And in the cell, there is something called a receptor. And you can imagine the whole thing as the hormone being a key and the receptor being a lock. So if the right key goes to the right lock, it opens the lock. And what happens is that the cell understands the signal that is carried by the hormone and then puts forward some reaction, some chemical reaction. So that's how hormones work. Now we have to um, take a look on, on what phytoestrogens actually are. So the misunderstanding is that if you eat stuff uh, containing a large amount of uh, phytoestrogens, and uh, let's say you are a man, what you are doing is you are taking um, female hormones into your body. And what is going to happen is that you are going to get problems and issues because those female hormones are going to cause things like breasts growing. <laughs> and that's something that you don't want to have as a man. And also, if you're a strength athlete, they're going to, um, yeah, you, you get to the issues like um, having more body fat and, uh, and, uh, and so on. Um, so it also it would impair your, uh, your physical uh, abilities and your physical parameters that, that you need for your sport. Is that really true? No, it isn't at all. Why? Because, because phytoestrogens are not the same as animal estrogens. Yeah? They're different. They're not lots, they're not like very different, but they're a little bit different. So what happens? Now, let's go back to our picture with the key and the lock. So what happens if the key that you try to use to open a lock is similar to a right key, but it is not the same. What happens is the key goes in into the receptor and tries to open the lock. But because it's not, it, it doesn't have the exact right structure, it can't open the lock. So no boobs, no, no breasts growing in men, nothing like that. What really happens is actually the opposite. Um, like for women, it can sometimes be, uh, be good if the estrogen level is controlled. And if you take a look uh, on, on, on some studies, you find out that phytoestrogens even help women to control their estrogen level, levels and thus um, even prevent breast cancer. And on that, let's just take a look on the video that I took from uh, nutritionalfacts.org. And let's hear what Dr. Greger has to say on that. Why do people who eat legumes, beans, chickpeas, split peas, and lentils, live longer? Well, men and women who eat legumes tended towards being lighter, having a slimmer waist, lower blood sugars, lower cholesterol lower triglycerides, better kidney function, lower blood pressure, so no surprise may live longer. But, interestingly, bean intake was a better protectant against mortality in women than men. They think this may be because cancer was the leading killer of women in this population, especially breast cancer. And we know that breast cancer survivals who eat soy foods, for example, have significantly lower likelihood of cancer recurrence. Eating soy foods appears to protect against the cancer coming back. This 2012 review looked at three prospective human studies done to date and found that women who ate the most soy had a 29% lower risk of dying from breast cancer and a 36% lower risk of cancer recurrence. And a fourth study was since published, and it showed the same thing. Soy food intake associated with longer survival and lower recurrence among breast cancer patients. With an average intake of soy phytonutrients above 17 mg a day, uh, which is about what's found in a single cup of soy milk, the mortality of breast cancer may be able to be reduced by as much as 38%.
Here's the survival curve over five years. The purple line represents the survival of the women with the highest soy consumption. As you can see, after two years, all the breast cancer survivors eating lots of soy were still alive. But a quarter to a third of the women who ate the least soy were dead. And after five years, 90% of the tofu lovers were still alive and kicking, whereas half of the tofu haters kicked the bucket. And you can see a similar relationship when you look at breast cancer survival and soy protein intake, as opposed to soy phytonutrient intake. The age of puberty for girls continues to decline. Last year, researchers published a study of more than 1,000 girls across the country and found a higher prevalence of onset of breast development among girls at ages 7 and 8 years old compared with those observed more than just a decade earlier. This has obvious psychosocial implications, but from a medical standpoint, the reason we're so concerned is that those who start developing at a younger age are at an increased risk of breast cancer later in life, due to the increased estrogen exposure. For every year puberty can be delayed, risk of future breast cancer may drop 7%. A century ago, girls were starting their periods at around age 16, which may help explain why breast cancer is now such an epidemic. So what's contributing to this premature development? New study last year following 3,000 girls found the single most important dietary determinant was how much meat girls eat. Meat intake, measured at 3 and 7 years, was strongly positively associated with starting their period by 12 years, 8 months. And so the trends in age at menarche in the West over the last century might reflect the trends in meat consumption. The second most powerful predictor was animal protein in general, so it wasn't just meat. The reason girls eating vegetarian have been found to develop more normally may also be influenced by their soy intake. Last year, a group of researchers calculated that girls drinking just like two cups of soy milk a week start developing breasts an average eight months later than those who drink hardly any. Soy failed to have an effect, however, on timing of puberty in boys. Okay, so as you see, um, fetal estrogens are one more fact that is largely misunderstood and uh, that isn't actually as problematic as some people think. So let's go on and take a look on some other things. So another thing that you uh, hear a lot is trypsin inhibitors in soy. So what are trypsin in inhibitors? Trypsin inhibitors are proteins that actually impair your, um, your ability to digest protein. So that's something that's really bad for someone who wants to build muscles, right? Because you want to get as digest and get in as, mu as much protein as you can. And if you eat something with trypsin inhibitors, that's a problem. So soy would be a problem then. That's right, but you have to consider that trypsin inhibitors, um, once you process the food, get broken because there are protein structures and they are quite um, uh, vulnerable to, uh, to uh, processing. So if you cook things up or if you process them in other ways, they get broken and they don't uh, function anymore. So if you then take a look on like um, things like tofu, you find out that the actual amount or the actual inhi uh, inhibiting um, uh, ability of tofu is only like two to five percent of uh, unprocessed soy. Um, in soy milk, it's like about ten percent or so. And uh, so what, what you what, what you can say is that. Um, the, the activity of those trypsin inhibitors, once foods are processed, and you, you need to process them, no one in the world uh, eats soy unprocessed. It's always processed in some way. So, and um, if it's processed, the trypsin inhibitors get broken up 
and there's no problem at all. And also, uh, what we find out in, in recent years in, in, in fresher studies is that a little bit of trypsin inhibiting can actually benefit your body. So, um, I would say it seems pretty much like uh, trypsin inhibitors are really not that much of a problem either. So that's con point number three that we have killed. Let's go on with number four. So number four would be then oxalic acid or oxalate. Um, oxalic acid can really be a problem, um, but one thing that you have to understand is oxalic acid is especially a problem to one special group of people, and that's people who have problems with, um, with kidney stones, because oxalic acid actually builds oxalic acid kidney stones. So if you're, and, and, but that's not an issue for, for everyone, that's an issue for those who are vulnerable to, to that condition and who have a history of problems with, with kidney stones. So if you're one of those people, you should have an eye on your soy uh, consumption because it can really um, give you problems with, um, with your uh, kidney stones. Um, but then on the, on, on the same uh, moment, you have to consider that a lot of other foods also contain um, oxalic acid. So you have to really keep an eye on a lot of other stuff too. And those people that have a history of problems there, they normally know which foods they have to keep an eye on. So um, I would say oxalic acid can be a problem, but not for everyone. And it's not that much of a problem. So we come to point number five, pithic acid. And with pithic acid, we can pretty much um, say the, the, the same things as uh, that apply to oxalic acid also apply here. So it can be a problem. Um, actually, pithic acid is, is, is a little bit more of a general problem for, for everyone because the problem with pithic acid is that it actually steals minerals that you take in. So it, it, um, it inhibits the, the intake of minerals that you have already um, taken in. Um, and that's a little bit of a problem or can be a little bit of a problem. But um, as we look on, on, on newer studies, we find out that a little bit of pithic acid can actually help with other things. Like uh, it seems to be uh, helpful um, preventing cancer, it seems to be helpful with, with, with some other, uh, like um, with controlling blood sugar and other things too. So it seems like um, it's not so much about uh, trying to not take in any uh, uh, pithic acid, but uh, more controlling the amounts. So, um, and, and also another thing is pithic acid is not a soy uh, exclusive problem, but it is also a problem in a lot of uh, cereals and uh, also a lot of legumes. Pithic acid sits um, on the outside of, uh, of, of grains and so on, so in, 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 the, in, in the skin. And uh, that means if you want to reduce pithic acid, it would be a good idea not to um, have uh, whole grains in every meal, but uh, instead um, having the non-whole gra uh, uh, grain version. Of, of some foods, like uh, instead of brown rice, having a polished white uh, uh, rice would be a good idea um, to not have that much of uh, pithic acid to control the amounts. So as we see, point number five, also uh, something that is not really that much of a general problem uh, and that much of, of, uh, of a huge, uh, huge thing actually. So now let's take a look on the pros. Um, I have already um, told you something about the pros in, in the last video, uh, and I also told you that I use soy products, and um, that I don't think that it's that much of a problem, but uh, you should, with, like with everything, you should control the amounts and you should have a good mix of, of, uh, of protein sources. But I think that in general, soy is okay. Why? Because, um, Soy gives you pre pretty balanced uh, amino acid, mix of amino acids. Um, untypical for, uh, for legumes, 
it is already pretty balanced, so you don't have to combine it even with, with other things to, to, um, to have a balanced uh, uh, amino acid profile. Um, and also, soy is quite cheap, so it's quite affordable if you want to take in big amounts of, of protein. And um, also, you, you have a big variety of sources, like tempeh, um, like tofu, like soy milk, like soy isolate, or uh, texturated soy. So there's really a big uh, variety of things that you can consume. So let's have a look on, uh, on, on the bottom line. So the take home message for today would be soy has some good and some not so good properties. So we have to take a look on um, which amount of soy actually. If you take a look on, on newer studies, we, it, it seems that three to five servings of soy protein a day should be okay. So link things like tofu or tempeh or soy protein based stuff. Three to five servings seems to be pretty perfect to get all the benefits without um, getting the problems, without getting to the problematic side of, of soy. Cooking and fermentation are great ways to um, enhance the good side of soy and diminish the bad side of soy. So cooking and fermentation, especially fermentation, are great ways to make soy even better. So the final message is enjoy your soy but don't overdo it. Just try to mix it up. There are so many great alternatives and there are so many great uh, plant-based alternatives. It's absolutely no problem to have soy in your diet and combine it with all those great alternatives that you have at hand. So mix it up and subscribe to our channel. So we are going to meet again when in the next episode we're going to talk about animal protein and plant-based protein and answer the question is animal protein really superior to plant-based protein see you next time